By any conceivable measure, uh, Michel Foucault is one of the profoundest and widest influences on contemporary political and social thought. Uh, according to Google metrics, uh, he is the most cited scholar uh, across the arts, humanities and sciences. He outstrips Marx, he outstrips Freud, he outstrips Einstein. And yet, curiously, he wrote very little about one of the defining motifs of our modern political landscape, uh, the social contract. And this is a, a curiosity uh, for which there are no doubt good Foucauldian uh, reasons uh, that our presenters will unpack for us in, in a few minutes. But the themes and the concepts that structure contractualism and contractarianism um, are not limited of course, to the use of the term social contract itself. Uh, the idea of the social contract is inextricably enmeshed uh, with ideas of legitimacy and sovereignty and, of course, power, all of which Foucault has a great deal to say about. So I hope that one thing that will become clear today is that in seeking to approach Foucault through the lens of the social contract, we're not forcing a square peg in, into a round hole, but we're allowing the constellation of Foucault's themes and concerns to arrange themselves perhaps in a fresh way, uh, even revealing fresh insights into his ideas. And so it's, it's with a, a personal sense of excitement and anticipation uh, that it's my pleasure to introduce the first of our two uh, speakers uh, for this seminar. Stuart Eldon is Professor of Political Theory uh, and Geography at Warwick University in the UK, uh, where his research sits at the intersection of uh, politics and philosophy and geography. His work focuses on two main areas, uh, the history, concept and practice of territory uh, and the history of 20th century French thought. He, he's the author of too many books uh, to list here. Uh, but I will note that we eagerly await his next volume, uh, The Early Foucault, uh, which is uh, due to be published by Polity Press in June 2021 this year. Uh, and it promises to examine Foucault's largely unknown work of the 1950s, uh, leading up to his first major book, The History of Madness, in 1961. Uh, Stewart appears regularly in the media, notably on a recent BBC Radio 3 Free Thinking episode in which he discussed Foucault's history of sexuality. Uh, and he, as will be known to many of us, also runs the indispensable Progressive Geographies website, uh, which has established itself as a key node uh, on the web uh, for matters geographical and theoretical. And Stuart's title today is The Yoke of Law and the Luster of Glory. So I'd ask you please to join me in welcoming Stuart Eldon. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's good to be virtually back at Monash. Um, thank you for the welcome. It's, it's great to be talking to you, um, to Mark, um, and to everyone else uh, around these, these questions. Now, as you said, perhaps it's surprising that Foucault doesn't talk about social contract theory very often. And the key discussions that he does provide of that term and of the tradition of political thought tend to come especially in his Collège de France lecture courses. And there's a few places where the social contract is, is at least a, a minor theme. There's a discussion of civil war and the contract in the punitive society. There's a discussion of the breaking of the social contract by the monster, by revolt in the abnormals course. There's a challenge to the tradition of the history of political thought in Society Must Be Defended, and I'm going to talk more about that course in a moment. And then he also makes an indication of what he thinks has happened as a shift from an implicit contract of security in territory to population security in the work on governmentality. And they're all interesting in themselves, and perhaps Mark is going to say something about uh, some of those. But just a couple of remarks from me on those general themes uh, by way of introduction. The first one is on this suggestion that Foucault makes that the role of the state in its contract or its pact of security with the people has shifted 
And he argues that it's moved from a territorial pact where the state or the, the political power guarantees the frontiers that you will be able to live in peace in your frontiers, he says, to a pact of population, you will be guaranteed. And he says that this is the guarantee from uncertainty, from accident, from damage, from risk, from illness, from lack of work, from tidal wave, from antisocial behaviour. And that second list has a number of key resonances today. Uh, but such a shift that Foucault is identifying is, of course, highly dependent on the status of a state, because some states definitely do have to secure their territory today, and some manifestly do still take little account of their population. And in the pandemic, uh, one of the things that I think has been interesting is that one of the ways or one approach that states have used to try to protect their population has been to close off their borders, to go back to an older model of territorial security, perhaps, or at least greatly restrict travel across those borders. The second general remark I want to make is that Foucault explicitly notes the way that the constitutions of states are not written for him in the ink of consent and of contract, but rather with the blood of those that have been defeated in war. And in a sense, that's a generalization of a point that we take from Thomas Hobbes, that a state that is formed by conquest can function as one that is created by contract if the people accept the ruler. And one of the key things that Foucault stresses, both in the punitive society, but also in society must be defended, is that the contract then should not be seen as an end to war with the establishment of a state replacing a state of war, but rather that war continues to be inherent in the very conflict that's going on within the state. That war, in a sense, is not exterior to politics or its extreme form, but is, in a sense, its very essence. But in my brief comments today, I want to actually do something rather different. I want to focus on a remark that Foucault makes in the 1975-76 lecture course, Society Must Be Defended, when Foucault suggests that we can understand the discourse of the historian as a sort of ceremony, whether it's oral or written, that must in reality produce both the justification of power and the reinforcement of that power. And Foucault says that traditional history had the aim of both recounting a past that provides both a legal foundation for power in the present and of provoking a fascination for the almost unbearable intensity of the glory of power. He says then that historical discourse uses both the yoke of law and the luster of glory, hence my title today. And he says in this way, historical um, reconstruction or historical justification and enforcement needs to be situated alongside other modes of commemoration or celebration. And he names rituals, coronations, funerals, ceremonies, legendary stories. History, he says, is an operator of power, an intensifier of power. And historical work then might stress the antiquity of kingdoms, the lineage of rulers, the heroes who founded polities. And he says that these two interlinked aspects of power are binding and dazzling, subjugating by imposing obligations and intensifying the luster of force. So the contract aspect is on the stress both of binding a contract and on the imposing of obligations as one form, but it's also to a, a more sort of spectacular or visible form of the display of power that might be done. And Foucault's point is that these two functions, he says, correspond very closely to two aspects of power as they're represented in religions, rituals, and Roman and more generally Indo-European legends. And the key passage in this course that I want to, to read and then try and unpack what Foucault is doing there uh, comes in the English on pages 68, 69 and on the French on page 60. So I'm going to read a, a passage and then talk about what I think Foucault is doing in that. Foucault says, in the Indo-European system of representing power, power always had two aspects or two faces and they are perpetually conjugated, conjoined. On the one hand, the juridical aspect, power uses obligations, oaths, commitments, and the law to bind. On the other, power has a magical function, role, and efficacy. Power dazzles and power petrifies. Jupiter, that eminently divine representative of power, the preeminent god of the first function and the first order in the Indo-European tripartite system, is both the god who binds and the god who hurls thunderbolts. Moving on a little bit, 
History then is the discourse of power, the discourse of the obligations power uses to subjugate. It's also the dazzling discourse that power uses to fascinate, terrorize and immobilize. In a word, power both binds and immobilizes and is both the founder and guarantor of order. History is precisely the discourse that intensifies and makes more efficacious the twin functions that guarantee order. In general terms, we can therefore say that until a very late stage in society, history was the history of sovereignty or a history that was deployed in the dimension and function of sovereignty. It is a Jupiterian history. It had a certain political function, which was precisely to be a ritual that reinforced sovereignty. Now, Foucault says that this is just a crude sketch, but he suggests that it provides the foundation for a past that a more modern historical approach begins to replace. This, he says, the new version is history as a conflict between races, which he describes as the first non-Roman or anti-Roman history that the West had ever known. Now, the question of race and the conflict of races is a well-known theme of this course. What I want to say something about, though, is the sense of sovereignty that Foucault is sketching that he thinks was preceding that, that conflict between races. Because there's a number of key terms that in his course he leaves unexplored. What's the basis for these two kinds of power that he outlines as operating within sovereignty? Where does this distinction between a juridical and a magical sense originate? What does it mean to of the first function, the first order? What is this Indo-European tripartite system? Why the reference to Jupiter? And how is Jupiter both the god that binds a contract and hurls thunderbolts, a weapon that we'd usually uh, relate to Mars or to the Norse god Thor? How might this be significant enough then to warrant the description of a Jupiterian history? Now, Foucault doesn't develop this point in detail in the course. He provides no reference, he cites no authority. And of course, that's un not uncommon in uh, Foucault's lectures. In mid 1970s Paris, many of his auditors would have made a connection and his editors actually fill in that reference for us. They say that Foucault is obviously referring to the work of Georges de Mazille. Now, a 21st century Anglophone audience, us today, perhaps unlikely to immediately make that same connection, and de Mazille is not so well known even in France today. And the editors add in the two works that they think that Foucault is thinking of in particular. One is a book called Mitra Varuna, an essay on two Indo-European representations of sovereignty, and the other is The Massive Myth and Epic. Now, relatively little of de Mazille's extensive work has been translated into English, although Mitra Varuna was translated in 1988. It first been published in France in 1940 and then was revised in 1948. Myth and Epic appeared in three volumes uh, between 1968 and 1973 and has gone through multiple re-editions in French. It's now available as a very large single volume. But it's only been partly translated into English. To give some sense of the scale of this book, um, this is the three volumes in one quarto edition of the text, but the second volume in the French has been translated as three separate books in English, The Stakes of the Warrior, The Plight of the Sorcerer and The Destiny of the King. And there's parts of the third volume uh, also in English. Now, most of these books by de Mazille are long out of print in, in English, even in the translation. And Mitra Varun is also very hard to find in French. So in a sense, de Mazille is a, an important reference for in mid-70s France, but perhaps not so noticed today. Now, I don't have time today, obviously, to go into a long sketch of de Mazille's voluminous work. But briefly, his main project from his doctoral thesis in 1924 was as a study of comparative Indo-European mythology looking at various different traditions to try to identify commonalities and also differences between those traditions. And for the principal project, de Mazille has this enormous range, stretching from India, Iran, Rome, Scandinavia to the Celts, and he shows how a comparative approach can reveal these similarities and differences between quite diverse sources. You can find initial sketches of his key ideas in a number of early works, but he sees 1938 as the year he makes a major breakthrough, his major breakthrough, identifying a fundamental division that is there in otherwise distinct tr traditions. And this is what's known as the tripartite or the trifunctional hypothesis, the divide between priests, warriors, and then a third class of farmers or traders. Now, two of his books mark this breakthrough in his thought in particular. One is a book that the title would translate as Myth and Gods of the Germans in 1939, 
which has three parts on myths of sovereignty, of warriors, and of vitality. And the other book where he really formulates this notion is the Mitra Varuna book from 1940 that concentrates on this first function of sovereignty and draws on examples in comparative mythology from, as I said, India to Iran, Rome, Greece, Scandinavia. What he suggests is the crucial um, issue is that the relation between a king, a Raj, and a priesthood of Brahman is fundamental to Indian hierarchy in the Veda, but also in Roman founding ideas of the king, the Rex, and the Flamen, the priests. And he suggests an etymological link between these terms, but it's really a, a functional link that's important. He says that in both India and Rome, the two names designate two connecting bodies, more precisely the two inseparable halves of a single body, the body of sovereignty. So you have a king and you have a priest or a priesthood, and that together these are the two parts of what he calls sovereignty. The dual body of sovereignty for Demazil sat at the head of the social hierarchy. The Brahmin, the priesthood, sat above the warrior class, and they sat above the breeders or farmers of the third group or caste. And he says this can also be found in legends of Rome. The Flamen is the priesthood, the military, and the farmers. And one of the best summaries of his position comes when he says that these are the three fundamental functions. The mastery of the sacred and knowledge with the form of temporal power it founds, number one. The physical st strength and warrior value, number two. And the fecundity and abundance with their conditions and consequences. And throughout his work, Dumazil provides many examples of how this tripartite model might structure society or mythology. He finds indications, for example, in Julius Caesar's writings of um, Celtic and Gallic society before the Roman conquest, with the Druids, the Equites, the cavalry forming the first two groups. He finds it in Irish pagan texts. He says that it's there in, in some degree in ancient Germanic societies, although he recognizes that they have no priesthood that strictly compares with the Brahmin, the Flamen, or the Druids. In the later Christian world, it includes the medieval oratores, bellatores, laboratores, i.e. those who pray, fight, and labor, which becomes the clergy, nobility, and third estate of the French Ancien Regime. And that's work that is extended by the historian Georges Duby, particularly in the book, The Three Orders, which was a book that actually developed out of a Collège de France seminar that Dumaziel attended some of the later sessions that Duby and his students were, were trying to use Dumaziel's work on much more ancient societies to think about medieval French society. Most importantly in Dumaziel's work is the way that he suggests that this three way or three um, trifunctional hypothesis can relate to gods in different religious systems. So in Rome, he says the gods of the three functions are Jupiter, Mars, and Quirinus, or Odin, Thor, and Freya in Norse mythology. And so Jupiter then is, as Foucault notes in his passage, the god of the first function in Rome. Now, Dumasil is one of these people who's continually revising and perfecting his ideas. He's continually adding in new uh, examples to try to uh, illustrate some of these claims. And there's many of his works where he develops these issues, but particularly in myth and epic, this late sort of summation work. In the second volume, he outlines these three types, the king and the sorcerer as the two forms of the first function, i.e. of sovereignty, the warrior of the second function, but there is in Dumasil's work no equivalent study of the third function of the producer. It's something that he promised, but it never actually appeared. But given the number of studies that Dumasil devoted to the first and second function, i.e. of sovereignty and of the warrior, this does seem to indicate Dumasil's preference for sovereignty and war as a focus for his work. So it's the first of these functions then that Dumasil is describing as sovereignty. And Foucault had already indicated the importance of Dumasil's understanding for his way of thinking about sovereignty in the Truth and Juridical Forms lectures that Foucault gave in Brazil in May 1973. Foucault talks of an ancient relation between power and knowledge in the Eastern Mediterranean, in which a political ruler holding power also held a knowledge that could not be more widely communicated. Foucault says, this is the form of power knowledge that Dumasil and his studies concerning the three functions as isolated, showing that the first function was that of a magical and religious political power. Knowledge of the gods, knowledge of the action that can be brought to bear on us by the gods, that whole magico-religious knowledge is present in the political function. 
So this is the, the, I think, the essential point that rather than conceiving this first function of sovereignty as a unitary god or source of power, Dumazil sees it as split into these two parts that are distinct, although often conjoined. He distinguishes between a worldly juridical form and a magical supernatural form of this power of sovereignty. And that had already been indicated by his suggestion that the king and the priest form these two parts of the inseparable whole. And in the preface to the original edition of Mitra Varuna, so from 1940, he says, this essay indicates a certain bipartite conception of sovereignty that appears to have been present among the Indo-Europeans and that dominated the mythologies of certain of the peoples who spoke Indo-European languages at the time of the earliest documents. Now in Indian mythology, Mitra and Varuna are the two gods that exemplify these two different parts of sovereignty. Mitra being associated with the open, the juridical, the right and light, Varuna with the hidden, the magical, the left and the dark. As Dumazil says, Mitra is the god under his reasoning aspect, luminous, ordered, calm, benevolent, priestly. Um, Varuna is the sovereign under his attacking aspect, dark, inspired, violent, terrible, warlike. So hence the title of the book, Mitra Varuna, for the two aspects of sovereignty. But Dumazil also discusses a number of other pairings in this work. In Rome, he says that Jupiter is the key god who accords to the first function, but when that function is analysed as the two forms of magical and juridical, it's Dias Phidias, the god of oaths, who sits alongside Jupiter in that first function. In Norse mythology, it's Odin and Tyre who represent the two forms of sovereignty. There's discussions also of the Celts, of Iran, even of the Greek myths. But Rome continues to be his key example in this work, but not just in terms of the, the mythologies, the pantheon of gods, but also its political history. Dumazil says that you find parallels in legends of a tyrannical king, often with magical powers, who is followed by a better, more just king. So he says the legendary founder of Rome, Romulus, he created the city, but it was the next king, Numa Pompilius, who founded many of Rome's legal, political and religious institutions. So this two part aspect of sovereignty can perhaps be compared to other modes of political power. If we call it the constitutional and the charismatic, it might bring to mind Max Weber or the religious and political rule relation well, that's essentially the medieval doctrine of the two swords of the church, spiritual power to use direct, temporal power to command in kings and rulers. And notoriously, in 1939, Dumazil himself suggested the Third Reich had based itself on earlier mythology, and that in this context, he says, Adolf Hitler could conceive, forge, and practice a sovereignty that no German overlord has known since the fabulous reign of Odin. Now, Dennis Hollier and Bruce Lincoln have also suggested this relation of magic and law of the power of the church, the power of the state, might owe something to Benito Mussolini's reconciliation of his power with that of the Vatican in the Lateran Treaty uh, from 1929, the decade before Dumazil elaborated this view. Now, whether that connection is there explicitly is debatable, but that treaty did, of course, deal with one crucial question, the temporal power of the papacy was now being restricted only to the Vatican City, with the acceptance of the Italian state's sovereignty over the former papal states. So this, this um, sort of detour through de Mazil is, in a sense, to try to explore what Foucault is meaning by this notion of sovereignty. It's a dual sense of the binding of contracts and the more physical sense of force. Now, when we're thinking about Foucault, we tend to focus on the other forms of power that Foucault discusses, discipline, governmentality, biopolitics, technologies of the self. And sovereignty is often seen as the understanding of power which they are replacing or displacing. But perhaps returning to what Foucault says about sovereignty and how he uses Dumazil to elucidate this, and particularly these two aspects of sovereignty, maybe that helps us in our understanding of the question of Foucault and the social contract. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Stuart. Please do join me uh, in uh, giving a, a, a zoomish uh, round of applause uh, to Stuart. Um, and uh, as I suggested at the beginning, we'll move straight on to our second paper. Although, if you do have any questions uh, for Stuart or a question comes into your mind at any time, please feel free to write it in the chat, uh, and then I will call on people 
uh, in the uh, discussion time to, to ask your questions. Viva voce. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure now uh, to be able to uh, introduce Mark Kelly, uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy uh, at Western Sydney University. Uh, Mark has published no less than four books uh, on Michel Foucault. Uh, we have The Political Philosophy of Michel Foucault, uh, Foucault's History of Sexuality, Volume 1, The Will to Knowledge, and Edinburgh Philosophical Guide, uh, Foucault and Politics, A Critical Introduction, and For Foucault, uh, Against Normative Political Theory, as well as a, a string of uh, book chapters and uh, articles on Foucault as well. His paper today uh, builds on themes uh, that he's been investigating in the context of an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship um, that, that carries the title, The Invention of Norms, How Ethics, Law and the Life Sciences Shape Our Social Selves. Uh, and his title for the day is Social Contract as Norm. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mark Kelly. Thanks, Chris, for that introduction. Wonderful. Um, can everyone hear me? I'll just check that before I keep talking. I'm getting some nods. Good. Thank you. Look, it's I'm really grateful to you, Chris, for inviting me to be part of this event and particularly honoured to be uh, combined with Stuart in it. Um, now, I've tried to avoid doing what I knew would um, not, I'd not be able to compete with Stuart on, namely, Kind of erudite close reading of Foucault uh, and indeed uh, you know Stuart's done so much more than that uh, in bringing in uh, all that stuff from Dumézil which is, is so fascinating and, and uh, precisely because so few of us are really really aware of Dumézil's nerve at this point but uh, so what I'm going to do is think really about you know how, what a Foucaultian approach to the, the social contract might look like um, with some textual references, but I mean, as Chris pointed out in his introduction, there's not, you know, not like there is a, a Foucault, Foucault's theory of the social contract to be found in the work. He's he's not done that work. Uh, so I've tried to think about a Foucauldian approach. Now I'm very concerned that uh, what I have to say will seem quite churlish in this context, uh, and I had kind of a sinking feeling really listening to, to aspects of Chris's introduction because. Um, you know the, the project that that Chris is engaged in, uh, and that, that you know we're all as part of this network engaged in, really that I've been invited to engage in, is, is a constructive project of thinking about the social contract. However, um, you know I'm inclined towards negativity, and on my account, that's really what Foucauldian approach is all about. It's essentially critical and negative, and I'm afraid you know much of what I have to say is is quite negative about the social contract uh, specifically. Nonetheless, uh, you know. Always hope that somehow, uh, e even in this moment of negativity, it will spark uh, something positive. I mean, that's that's certainly, I think, what, what Foucault is trying to do with his critique. And, and I hope that this will be uh, taken as, as a friendly approach, even if it uh, might in some ways appear hostile. Uh, it's not always the case when I give, give such approaches, but uh, we'll see. So I'm going to start, actually, I should have uh, flagged this straight away. I'm going to um, share a PowerPoint, uh, which really is is mainly there just for the, the sake of having something more interesting than my face to look at. Um, so uh, starting with a, a picture of Foucault. Uh, however, I haven't got my quotes up here. So I'm going to start with a quote uh, from Foucault's Order of Things. I'll duly read out. You can read along with me. Uh, Utopias afford consolation. Although they have no real locality, there is nevertheless a fantastic untroubled region in which they are able to unfold. They open up cities with vast avenues, superbly planted gardens, countries where life is easy, even though the road to them is chimerical. Now, of course, uh, implicitly here, I'm situating the notion of social contract as utopia. Uh, now, that's certainly something one can question, and I will uh, consider how those two things fit together. But I, I think this is the root of the way I, uh, you know, we can have a kind of Foucauldian approach to the social contract is by thinking of it in uh, this light as, as, as a utopian fantasy. And I, I think that's, um, well, if I, if I can arrogate the right to say this, what Foucault would say uh, about it. So we all know that the notion of a social contract is a fiction. Uh, it's 
not clear indeed that it was ever intended as anything more than a fiction. Uh, although we can argue about the extent to which the great historical social contract theorists realized it was a fiction and the extent to which they thought they were engaged in the kind of genealogy of their political societies. But of course, today, generally, we don't believe there was ever a real state of nature in the sense that it's imagined. So, of course, we don't believe today, at least I, no one I can think of really believes there was a, a real social contract actually signed at the beginning of our society. Rather, things are much messier than this. Uh, this does not mean that there is not some kind of implicit contract undergirding our society, nor that there has not always been one. The governed consent to government on the basis that it does something for them. This is what uh, one aspect of social contract theory. Without such an understanding, we might say we face anarchy, things will fall apart. Against this, the Foucauldian stance, I would suggest, consists always in asking a kind of meta question. Namely, in this case, what is the political function of this idealization? Theory tends to present itself as a kind of neutral arbiter that stands above or outside of an historical situation, but Foucault's a priori is that it never does, except perhaps in the moment of pure critique. The attempt to imagine society as based in a social contract must have some kind of social regulative function, considering how widespread it has become. We can make some quite obvious points that are not at all original in relation to this concept of the social contract, namely how redolent of capitalism it is because it imagines society and politics as a kind of commercial transaction, and because it imagines human beings as individuals existing somehow prior to or apart from society. As such, it's prima facie a uh, generically liberal rather than socialist or conservative notion. One can admit all this, like Richard Rorty, and argue precisely on this basis that it's an indispensable notion for us in our liberal capitalist society. If we don't see society this way, it will cease to work and we'll lose the benefits. At this point, I tend strongly to disagree on a kind of empirical basis. I don't think we need this notion as a society because I don't think this notion performs a function for ordinary persons of making them feel bound to society. All of us in our everyday lives see the established contours of our society as a natural fact. We do not need to be persuaded to give consent to them except insofar as they become a problem for us. Intellectuals, like us, naturally come to see almost everything as a problem and thus require these ideological justifications. But that's precisely a problem for political theory. And it's therefore at this level that I think that the theory of the social contract operates as it long has, namely as a fantasy of politically engaged intellectual that allows us to reimagine the hard genealogical realities of a society, which Stuart alluded to, uh, talking about Foucault's account, that has come into existence, as Foucault says, through the ossification of relations of domination, and instead think this as a kind of benign or consensual affair. This then leads in turn to an attempt to think the appearance of blatant domination in our societies as exceptional problems to be dealt with through reform rather than the visible tips of the iceberg of power relations as Foucault saw them to be. Let me be extremely clear here. The social contract is a utopian concept and the function of utopian concepts is always, on Foucault's account, to legitimate realities through an appeal to a perfected but unreal version of reality in which problems do not occur. Effectively, then, utopian thinking is the fantasization of reality or the substitution of a fantasy for reality. In a sense, this is necessary for us to exist as human beings. The cold chaos of the real is not cognizable to us without a grid of fantasization that constitutes our image of reality. But from this point of view, any defense of the social contract qua necessary legitimating concept falls down due to the triviality of the procedure. Absent a specific theory of the social contract, society will not collapse, I think. I, as an individual, might have my worldview collapse, particularly you know, as a political theorist, but society as such, I don't think, is dependent on it. Foucault offers a, an alternative view of intellectual labor to this uh, legitimating function. Uh, and as I'm suggesting, really kind of self-justifying legitimating function in this case. Uh, Foucault's vision is for the intellectual to eschew any form of utopian thinking and instead to think critically insofar as it's possible to beyond the limitations of thinking within the frame offered to us by our culture and society. 
That is, in other terms, that the intellectual should not be concerned with contributing to shoring up our political society through ideologically reproducing it, but questioning its foundations. Now, such observations pertain most clearly to the kind of neo-contractarianism of contemporary political philosophy, most influentially exemplified by John Rawls. How does this relate to the actual functions of total contract theory historically, however? Were the classical social contract theorists excusing reality in the way that Rawls does contemporary liberalism? Here I'm depending a little bit on, if there were a footnote here, it would be to uh, you know, Raymond Goyce's um, critique of Rawls. Uh, some of the classical theorists, I think, assuredly were doing something similar. Hobbes and Locke, both in their own ways, were providing justificatory schemas, albeit for effectively opposite sides of 17th century English politics, although this might also be said not to be due to them being on substantively different sides so much as just different moments in Britain's political evolution, one in which revolution was terrifying and extremist, that would be Hobbes, and the other in which it was a sensible via media between extreme positions, Locke's case. What though of perhaps the most famous contractarian of them all, the man that coined the phrase Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Rousseau was surely condemning existing reality by means of his utopianism, not seeking to justify it, such a radical utopianism has a different function in respect of existing political reality. Uh, but to the extent that it is, it is successful for Foucault, it will inevitably have the same function, more or less, in relation to some later political reality, which, of course, uh, in Rousseau's case, was the French Revolution and the Republican government that uh, came to power after it. It became uh, an excuse not for what Rousseau found, but uh, something that came later, which was partly influenced by him. Beyond the specifics of particular theories, here I get to my title, we have the generality of the notion of the social contract itself. And this is the level at which the social contract conceptually provides a normative model for society in general. That is, it is understood that society ought to be a harmonious and unitary community based around adherence to shared arrangements which are supposed to benefit all mutually. The idea of mutual benefit for all in particular is an extraordinary one given how implausible and elusive it is. You might ask, of course, what the harm is in putting forward such a magnificent ideal. The Foucauldian answer, I think, is precisely that it occludes the extent to which society involves profound payoffs in welfare between groups and also the absence of any objective standard for welfare. Is not to say that society is a zero-sum game, far from it. Rather, it is to say that society is a holistic game that is not ultimately about some form of contract or horse trading between individuals or groups, but rather is the very basis for the existence of individuals as such. The concept of the social contract rests on the existence of a society that does not rest on a social contract. As such, it is the social contract is a relatively epiphenomenal concept, even if it also begins to play a marginal role in the constitution of society. The concept of a social contract is a phenomenon of a society that needs to believe in its own perfectibility. What is this general need for our society to believe it is perfectible? It is in short an effect of secularism and the movement of eschatological hopes into the temporal, the drive to create heaven on earth. And here I'm perhaps uh, moving closer to Eric Verglin than to Foucault, uh, although I hope I'm somewhere between the two, deriving from both of them, Verglin's concept of immanentizing the eschaton. This move is, in my view, a problematic one. And on my account, this is, uh, I mean, a larger account that I'm not going to develop here. Um, this is, you know, the, the signature move of our entire society, our society of the norm, uh, to think of all things always as being uh, perfectible in the direction of a norm. I think this um, is uh, accountable for much of our personal conduct, but also for our politics. Um, the idea that we are progressively moving forward towards uh, some form of perfection guides our political action. I think 
uh, these eschatological ideas are absurd when taken and potentially dangerous in some ways when taken into the political realm. Conventional religious hopes for heaven depend on the impossibility, uh, or rather the, in, the possibility of impossibility precisely. So, you know, Christian worldview, I take it. Um, the hope for perfection is founded on the possibility that God can make possible what seems impossible. That is, it's a matter of faith, even if believers certainly stray into an overconfidence that takes this to be a matter of assured fact and knowledge. The social contract for all that it might be a fiction and acknowledged as such does not seem to me to have such a character of an acknowledged impossibility, precisely because it is never posited as otherworldly. Rather, if it is couched as a kind of asymptotic telos, it is so because it is taken to have a kind of prima facie possibility. We think we can get to our utopian vision in principle, even if we don't really think we will in practice. No miracle is needed to do so. Uh, indeed, we are already well on the way. Salvation is within our grasp and needs only human artifice to achieve it and the defeat of our demiurgic enemies. The social contract implies by the very failure of reality to live up to it, that there must be some enemy, the antisocial element, the free rider, the parasite who is standing between us and paradise. Rather than expecting the enemy to meet their comeuppance uh, by divine agency, it becomes imperative for us to extirpate, control, re-educate, even exterminate in the name of the one who remains outside the social contract but fails voluntarily to exit the territory it covers. Now, at this point, I'm quite conscious that some of the rhetoric I'm employing might sound very hyperbolic, and I'm trying to make a kind of... Um, uh, you know, the, high, the rhetorical move one finds to some extent in Giorgio Gambon, for example, where I start uh, claiming that, that uh, everything leads inarguably, inarguably towards genocide. Uh, that's not my point. Um, rather, you know, it's, the Foucauldian point, I take it, is not entirely dissimilar, but more modest in the sense that this is a permanent danger of all such politics. And my claim here really is not specifically at this point about the social contract as such, um, but a rather more general one about politics as such. As Foucault says, a couple of uh, pictures I didn't up there. Uh, Foucault says in the first lecture of uh, his 1978-79 lecture series, um, Security, Territory, Population, in a, sorry, 77-78, it's right in front of me. Uh, in a phrase grossly mistranslated in the English translation, I will therefore propose only one imperative, but it will be categorical and unconditional. Never do politics. So you know, Foucault's sites are not, not merely you know, particular uh, forms of political theory, but the entire edifice. And as I argued in uh, the most recent book of uh, mine that came out, Chris generously named in the introduction for Foucault against normative political theory, um, when speaking about normative political theory, I maintain that Foucault is against all of its three elements. He's against the normativity, he's against the, uh, I think, politicality, politics, uh, and against the theoretical nature of it. So all, on all three fronts, uh, Foucault kind of doesn't want a bar of it. Now, uh, I tried to you know, anticipate um, a little bit uh, what Chris might think in particular, I, uh, I think of him as a privileged interlocutor here, although perhaps as the chair, he won't be able to, to really say everything he might want to about what I've just said. Uh, and, and at the risk of putting words into his mouth and the much greater risk of just projecting my own insecurities, I imagine the obvious response to this would, would effectively be a kind of Derridean one, uh, one which would suggest that there is a more sophisticated version of the social contract than the one that this Foucauldian critique attacks. Namely, you know, Foucault is attacking a, a kind of classical form of the social of social contract theory or you know, conventional liberalism. Uh, but we could, against that, have a more sophisticated reading that places the social contract under erasure. 
uh, which doesn't have the violence of a determinate utopian vision that attempts to crush everything that stands in its way. I mean, thinking here again, really, of the French Revolution, for example, but which nonetheless gestures towards the social contract to come that is teleologically related to the current ambiguous form of the social contract that we find in the society around us. Now, I think such an approach towards a social contract would accurately describe how the social contract works for us uh, as you know, asymptotic goals, um, you know, a reality that is profoundly ambiguous and apparatic. However, I don't believe that for all that it entirely evades the kind of Foucauldian concerns that I've been trying to raise. For me, and here I'm branching off from Foucault perhaps even more than I have already, I think the necessary gesture is to cease to hope for salvation from politics. Now, this is something that Foucault talks about in passing that greatly preoccupies me in his uh, lecture series, The Hermeneutics of the Subject, where you know, he, he talks about the fact that um, Spirituality, effectively, has disappeared in the contemporary West. By spirituality, Foucault means the idea that one needs to change one's subjectivity to gain access to special knowledge. This has taken many forms over many centuries, millennia. Foucault traces it back to ancient Greece, but of course, it's certainly alive and well in a certain form in the long history of Christian civilization in Europe. What Foucault thinks has happened uh, in the not even modern era, but more recently in late modernity, is that we have a kind of effectively crypto spiritual movements, I think you could say. And he, he talks specifically about uh, Marxism and psychoanalysis in this regard. And Marxism particularly preoccupies me because I'm, in, in effect, a kind of recovering Marxist. And it seems to me that his critique of Marxism here is ultimately, and it's taken, I've been thinking about this for, for 10 plus years now, but, but really it comes to a, a central paradox in Marxism. Of course, when we talk about Marxism, we're a little bit off the social contract. Yeah, I can kind of bend this back towards the, the top. Uh, with Marxism, there's a paradox that Marxism effectively operates for people like a spirituality or like a quasi-religion. Uh, it is something they pin their subjectivity to. But it's paradoxical precisely because Marxism doesn't allow that that's what it is. Marxism thinks of itself as thoroughly materialist. It doesn't think of itself as a spirituality. And this should be counterposed to a genuinely religious worldview, which says... It is doing what it is doing. It is a spirituality. Its purpose is precisely uh, to produce subjectivity. Now, this, I think, in, it, it is a more general problem, however, outside of Marxism. Marxism is peculiarly like this because of, you know, we could say, uh, I won't name any organizations, but the kind of cultish nature of certain Marxist organizations, um, the, the way one is inculcated into the ideology. Uh, of course, we don't expect this with social contract theory. But nonetheless, the basic function of the social contract as a fantasy, a utopia, Foucault's account, take it back to the, the note that I began on, serves a kind of subjective function. It serves a function of orientation of subjectivity, um, but in a way that profoundly loses sight of the problem of subjectivity itself and instead moves uh, it onto the critical domain. And what I think, uh, you know, and here I'm, I'm trying to kind of, well, I'm thinking this is, this is the, the um, trajectory we see in Foucault's late work. I mean, running right through, of course, to the recently published uh, in English, uh, fourth volume of the history of sexuality. Which is not to say I think Foucault would have made the kind of pronouncement I'm about to make, but I think it, it follows the trajectory of, of his thinking in this period, which is that um, there's a 
neglects of the possibility of constituting deliberately constituting subjectivity itself that one finds in different ways both in classical antiquity and then later in Christianity and that this in some sense Foucault says as much is something it's necessary for us to recover and that's not to say we have to go back to earlier forms of doing this and Foucault's always very clear about that he's not saying we just need to return to the Greek care of the self or something like that but that this is what Foucault thinks is needed. So uh, the reason I, I say this is because Foucault effectively has said, uh, as I quoted, never do politics, that's my sole imperative. He's trying to suggest that intellectuals shouldn't be engaged in political theory, thinking in a utopian way about politics, which is essentially what political theory, political philosophy is uh, to core. I mean, the, of course you can find exceptions, but that's basically what the paradigm of political thought an intellectual level is in our society. It's profoundly utopian. Instead, I think, then, uh, what Foucault's work points us towards is um, a reactivation of the spiritual plane as such outside of politics. It's not that they can't have any relationship to politics, but that politics has increasingly tended to substitute for it, and that that is in itself a kind of problem. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Do, do please join me uh, in, in thanking Mark uh, via Zoom. Um, uh, as I suggested at the beginning, we're, we're now going to uh, move into a time in which I'm going to encourage our two presenters to um, interact uh, around the ideas that, that they've um, set before us. I, I'm going to try and catalyze that interaction with, with one question that I hope can, can embrace um, both what Stuart and what Mark have been saying. And then, then my intention is to, to step back uh, and let the conversation go where it will before um, we, we open to general questions and discussion afterwards. And my, my question, my, my invitation to, to discussion is this. Um, that, that it seems that there's something in what both of you have said um, that has the potential, perhaps, to, to reframe the social contract quite radically, not necessarily in a destructive way either, although part of it would be, would be destructive. So, uh, Stuart, you, you mentioned the relationship between uh, contract and, and its representation, um, and, and I guess my way into that would be, do you think, either from a Foucauldian or from a Dumasilian point of view, that that sovereignty binds because it dazzles, or does it dazzle because it binds? Uh, in other words, it is the spectacle uh, a, an index of something that is happening outside of it, or, or is the spectacle itself actually doing the work um, uh, of? Uh, of power and sovereignty. And, and Mark, the, the way that I would try and get at something similar in terms of what you were saying um, is starting with this idea of the social contract as, as utopia. Uh, and you mentioned that its function uh, therefore is to legitimate. But I guess um, I, I would want to raise the question, don't utopias have another function as well as legitimation, uh, which is a function of creation? Uh, and so I guess my, my invitation to, um, to reflection to both of you is, a, a, is what we're inching towards here in a Foucauldian frame, the idea that the social contract is actually performative, that, that it creates more than it describes. Like Martin Luther King's, I have a dream. It, it, it doesn't register something that's already there. It, it seeks to bring into being that of which it speaks. Um, it, it's the rhetoric, isn't it? If, if you can see it, then you can be it. Well, it, the social contract is the seeing it uh, in that little phrase. And so to, to sharpen that as a question, to what extent do you both think that a Foucauldian approach encourages us to see the social contract as performative, as a creative intervention, uh, rather than the, the recovery of some putative, authentic, lost origin? You want to go first, Stuart? I, I can try. Um, I'm not sure I can answer Chris's question. I think that's a very interesting one. 
I suppose what I'd say is that what, what Foucault's trying to suggest in, in the passage that I drew on and then the understanding I think that Foucault has of de Maziel's work that he, he, was, he was using to, to examine that was about a form of power that Foucault thinks has been displaced. So it, 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 it wasn't an attempt in that, I think, for Foucault or, or de Maziel to, to provide a diagnosis directly of our present moment. It was to try to understand the way that a form of power had operated, which has been displaced, um, not entirely kind of abandoned, but 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 is not now the focus of the way that, that we're thinking about that. And I think that what I would say in, in relation to this wider question about the social contract, and I think what what for me thinking about these questions in, in response to your invitation to speak today has been useful in, in thinking that even if we don't think that the social contract really is that helpful as a as a model for understanding contemporary politics or that, that um that, you know liberal theory is not not adequate to addressing those there are still many contracts in politics in law in society and that perhaps thinking critically about this notion of the social contract might be helpful in thinking about those. Um, and so I suppose that that's why I thought that, you know, where does Foucault talk about contracts? And it, it seems to be in this understanding of sovereignty that, that preceded, whether it's discipline or, or governmentality or the different modalities of power that Foucault is trying to think about, but that there may still be kind of elements of that earlier way of thinking that are, that are still at play in there. And there I wonder whether the contract is still in play, even if the idea of the social contract in the way that the traditional political theorists have, have talked about it isn't present. And there is quite a lot in Foucault about kind of oaths and um, the question of commitment and the question of, of a, a contractual relation, whether it's a legal or an economic or a political one. And that, that may have kind of these elements of that earlier model. So I suppose that would be part. And I suppose you could also say the same thing about the kind of the, the, the power that dazzles or the power that um, displays in an overt sense. And the the, um, the obvious example of that in Foucault is the beginning of, of severe punia, discipline and punish with the, the, the spectacular execution torture public display of uh, on on the body of, of Damien's that the, the would-be regicide so but Foucault says that there is a trace of that there's a line in in, in discipline and punish where he says there is a torturous trace or a torturous sediment that that carries through into modern forms of punishment and so so it, it's whether there's a and this sounds very Derridean in a sense but the kind of the trace or the 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 element that that continues or that 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 carries forward into the model. And so I suppose that's where I think the contract perhaps goes forward into Foucault. Um, th there was a question in the chat that I can come back to, um, but, but I'll let Mark try and address your big question. So I just want to uh, come in and, and bounce off the back of what Stuart just said, which I take it was your intention all along with this, uh, Chris, as you were saying, to get a conversation between us. And, and I mean, what Stuart was just saying about these kind of traces of the contract, I mean, it's, it's hard to, to find them in society must be defended is a is a place Stuart mentioned others where you find it the notion of the contract uh, sensibly strict to but it, I mean I take it the contract is pretty obviously um, and the notion of a social contract in the firing line of Foucault's critique and particularly in the history of sexuality volume one of what he thinks of as a juridico legal conception of power I mean this is is you know Foucault's political views 101. Foucault thinks that um, there's a conception of um, power, which I mean, it also brings in the figure of uh, the, ex the execution of Damion that uh, Stuart <laughs> brought up. Um, you know, the, this this spectacular power going back to the Middle Ages, rooted in monarchical power, that and Foucault says in his History of Sexuality, Volume One, has produced a juridical legal conception of power, which continues zombie-like without its head cut off to the present day. I mean, that's that's uh, essentially, you know, what what Foucault thinks about that that kind of logic. Um, now, this the question you you, you asked me more directly, Chris. Uh, was about um, this, this possibility of, uh, you, you know, and those were fantastic questions, both, both for Stuart and to me, and this, this question of utopia is, is creative. Now, 
I mean, it's, it's certainly not something one one can rule out. I mean, I take it that, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's the fact and also I think Foucault's view that it, it's radically unpredictable um, what uh, political consequences of discourse will be. I mean, one another thing that Foucault says that I like to dwell on in the History of Sexuality Volume 1 is that um, discourse is tactically polyvalent. That is that... Uh, the same discourse or very similar one, different times and different contexts can have very different meanings. I mean, and I take it, you know, if we talk about um, Martin Luther King Jr., then um, we could find things that he says that, you know, in someone else's mouth, the similar trope has very different meaning. Um, I'm, not, I'm not getting into the specifics, but so that from that point of view and say something to actually say something positive for once, uh, I mean, from that point of view, and I think here I'm trying to echo Stuart as well, there is always a kind of positive potential uh, in this this concept of the social contract, as there is in any any political uh, you know concept. So one can't totally rule that out. Uh, and you know, one thing that Foucault is actually pretty clear about: um, society must be defended. For example, is that um, you know the the main way that the power, particularly new forms of power, discipline, and biopolitics, are contested is through appealing precisely to older models of the law, and. You know, Foucault, obviously, when he says that, is hesitant to use such conservative models. I mean, Foucault's idea always seems to be, well, you know, let's let's not try and get anything from the past will be purely negative. But on the other hand, he does acknowledge the possible political efficacy of, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, varied, varied uh, conceptual tools. So there is that. Uh, the, the question of the creativity of utopia Utopian thought really specifically, I mean, I, I kind of feel it leads to the, you know, um, I mean, there's a specific question there about the normativity of creativity that makes me think about um, Peter Horwood, uh, as you mentioned him earlier, his, his, um, his reading of Deleuze and the kind of idea of a, a philosophy which lords creativity for its positivity without being necessarily concerned what one is creating. And I, I think that, so in, yeah, I'm in a sense, I'm happy to say that utopia is creative, but that I'm not happy to put a positive normative valence on creativity. Uh, and I don't think kind of Foucault would be either. I mean, there's um, there's some interesting, there's an interesting moment in his, his um, famous televised discussion with Chomsky, where, where Chomsky starts talking about human creativity and Foucault's very uncomfortable with it. Like it's a, I feel like it's a concept that Foucault's not very happy about, but anyway. Um, Thank you. Um, just before we move to general questions, and do do please type um, them in the chat if you have any. Um, I, I I just want to invite Stuart and Mark, without any dragooning from me, uh, to offer any any comments or reflections you have uh, on each other's papers. Uh, should should there be such? No, I, I don't think I have anything immediate to say. I mean, I might, you know, as I continue to think about what Mark has said, um, I'm, I'm happy to go to more general comments and maybe we can connect the papers again through that. Yeah, and um, I similarly, I mean, particularly because of the, the fa fascinating treatment of Dumizil in Stuart's paper, but yeah, I, I need to gestate it a little bit, I think. Wonderful. Um, in that case, could I invite uh, Thaddeus, please, uh, to turn on your video and audio and, and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my question was uh, actually quite uh, simple. Uh, Stuart, thank you very much for this interesting talk and also Mark. Um, uh, yeah, for Stuart, uh, you talked very briefly about the, the move from a social contract of the state to a social contract of, the, of you. That, uh, to both talk about. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit because I found it very interesting to hear a little bit more. Thank you. Chris, shall I just go, go straight ahead? So, no, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I made that comment only very, very briefly in passing because I was trying to survey where Foucault talks about the contract. That that explicit moment when he talks about that is in a piece he wrote about the extradition of Klaus Croissant, who is a um, lawyer working on behalf of the Bader Meinhof gang. But it, it, it's at the same time that Foucault is giving the, the courses that we think of as the governmentality courses, the security territory population uh, lecture course, particularly. 
And in that course, one of the things that Foucault says is that the, the kind of object of government has shifted from territory to population. Now, I think we can dispute that. And I've, I, in the work I've done on territory, I've, I've kind of challenged what I think that Foucault is suggesting there is a shift. Um, it's not to say that population doesn't become an object of government. It, it, it clearly does. But I think that territory in its modern form is produced by many of the same kind of governmental and other techniques as, as population. But, but leave, leave that aside. Foucault is here generalizing and saying it's not just that the, the object of government has shifted from territory to population, but that the implicit contract with people has changed. So instead of saying, you know, that the, the, the main kind of object of government is to establish peace, and peace of the borders and that you won't be invaded and that your life won't be at threat from kind of foreign incursion or something like that. Foucault's suggestion is that the, the, um, the contracts that the state or the political power more generally has with its population is that, you know, we'll protect you from getting sick, um, from, you know, losing your job, from not having a house to, um, protection from natural disasters, protection from famine, these kinds of questions. And that Foucault tries to characterize that as a shift in the, the implicit contract that a state political power has with its people. Um, so it just seemed to me to be an interesting example. I mean, and I think we could, you know, historically, we could complicate that story. I'm not sure it's quite straightforward as, as Foucault's there suggesting. And my very quick comment about the, the pandemic was, you know, in, in a sense of kind of, how, how does that play out today? Well, well, one of the ways has been some states have been very, very strict about controlling their borders. Australia is, you know, one, one example very clearly, um, whereas the UK has been almost the complete opposite of that. Um, and sort of a year on, we're now only just beginning to think, well, actually, maybe that's quite important. So uh, that seemed to me to be an interesting example of, of the one of the ways that the um, political actors are now trying to protect their population is by going back to that idea of, of securing the borders. But, but that's, that, that's what the point was that I was trying to just very briefly touch on. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Thaddeus, any brief comeback? You're good, excellent. Uh, could I then please invite Bill uh, to turn on your video and ask your question, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Stuart and Mark, for your presentations. Um, my interest is really, um, really as a, I guess I'm more of a pracademic, you know, kind of interested in the practical implications of theory, uh, particularly for marginalised and impoverished groups, um, chronically, chronically marginalised. And um, uh, so often um, poverty is, as you know, is gendered um uh, and so sort affects of age so um uh yeah that um that's where my question is then sort of how do you anchor this um and, and what how does fico help us mark i think i'm going to throw that one to you wonderful um well i mean there's there's <laughs> There's a, there's a two parter really there. I mean, it's how does how does um, how do you anchor it? I mean, in in a sense, I've I've tried to suggest. Uh, well, I guess there's there's lots of different ways you can anchor it, but that's um, it, it's in a sense not what I'm talking about. I mean, the, the question that I, if we can go to the last bit, which is how does Fuka help us, which is like a very very important question. I mean, particularly. You know, um, I can imagine someone listening to my talk, perhaps not you, Bill, but you know, like, uh, like what, what, what is the point of of being so relentlessly negative? Uh, I mean, the the idea uh, is that that Foucault is helpful precisely by seeing how uh, you know these things might be constraining or limiting, uh, and how they're involved in in networks of power relations, which are, are causing the the problems that um, you might be concerned with. So um, people are. You know, I mean, I, I would tend to suggest in my my you know critical mode that that really what 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 Foucault's offering is 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 you know 
critical way of looking at like how how does how does thinking about things in terms of the social contract lead to marginalization of groups rather than the positive project of trying to think how how we can use that concept to um try to try to get out of those problems um precisely because it's i mean it's a kind of um the concepts like this on Foucault's account, I take it, uh, is a metaphor which I think is mine, not Foucault's, but they're hooks for power. That you know, power will, will get into this this idea of a, a social contract and and then use it to um, you know amplify itself in relation to solutions to, to problems. That in fact, um, you know, when when the state gets involved in these things, that um, although certainly they do alleviate uh, people's um, problems that's no no question particularly if we're talking about problems at a kind of bio, biomedical or biological level uh at the same time uh the power is increased in in the sense that um you know there's there's um an increase in control thank you um bill do you have oh um stuart if you have anything to add and then bill if you want to come back on anything. no i i just I mean, I'm grateful for Mark going first on that one. I think I think that's a really helpful way to think about it. Is that, that Foucault is interested in how, in a sense, how do the marginalised get produced? How do they get excluded? How do they get um, um, put into those kinds of positions? And what is it that is in the both in the, the the explicit power relations, but also in in the ways that we understand problems, the way that we construct them, that maybe puts people into those kinds of positions, and that that a lot of Foucault's work from the, the the mentally ill to the um the people without work to the people that are incarcerated the people that are sick um people who are uh, sexually sexually marginalized um because of they're not fitting into dominant how do those groups get produced and how do they get excluded and you know so how both in terms of an understanding of them but also in terms of the practical consequences this has so i think that's where foucault is helpful in trying to understand that rather than immediately kind of the you know that you can turn this into a kind of a um policy or a um you know immediate kind of response in that way wonderful we we have about um 10 minutes left and and i do have um lots of questions that i would like to ask but if, if i could just ask one question uh to each of our uh, speakers, I'll ask them both together and, and, and then feel free to answer each other's questions uh, if you like. Um, uh, Stuart, a, a really fascinating material on Dumézil and, and the way in which um, he's he's interfacing with Foucault and this, this theme of the, the contract as well. It, it struck me that when you mentioned Dumézil's um, archaic capitaline triad, so we've got Mars for war, Jupiter for, for religion and sovereignty, and then Quirinus for, for production and trade. Um, the, the, the social contract has been, or at least could be remade in the image of each of those successively. Um, and uh, our social contract today is a very Quirinian one. Uh, it is uh, all about uh, the way in which society is created by by profit and the accumulation of capital, uh, and I wondered uh, if whether with either a Dumasilian or a Foucauldian hat on, you you would want to respond uh, to that sort of uh, way of viewing the social contract, it's almost a prism to to, to um, split the elements in the social contract into those three elements and to and to identify the Quirinian with the present moment, um, and. Uh, Mark, you, you were mentioning, if I understood correctly at one point, that the, the problem with the social contract uh, is that it isn't otherworldly. Um, and I, I guess my follow-up question to that would be, it, it does, does the foundation of society, therefore, um, need to be otherworldly? Uh, and is there an imminent solution to the problem, immanent solution to the problem of the lack of otherworldliness, or to, to use Heidegger's phrase, can only a god uh, save us now? I think we're possibly locked in a kind of um, impasse of politeness. Um, Stuart, do you want to go first or shall I? Okay. I'm um, um, happy either way. Mark, go ahead, yeah, please. Sure. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, uh, 
So great, great question, Chris. Uh, you know, um, but my short answer is probably yes. But the probably is doing some work there. I mean, one of the one of the problems in these situations is, and I mean, this is something that is is um, so fundamental for Foucault, I think, so fundamental that it, it barely gets stated. The extent to which the future is opaque to us, and we don't really know the possibilities. So we're talking about, you know, and this is, I think it's a real a priori, uh, not, not what he said is a, a priori, like a historical a priori, but a real a priori of Foucault's approach uh, right right throughout his, his um, you know, economical career, that he, he refuses to talk about what might replace the things he's critiquing. And because on his account, any attempt to do that is utopian and caught within the frame of the present. So when we say, you know, it, it's it's very tempting. And if I had to say yes or no, I would say yes to the idea that you need to have something like a religious worldview in place of the social contract. Or the, the idea to have a secularized social contract is never going to function in the same way that um, you know, a, a supernatural version would, and that, you know, basically every society that's ever existed until late modernity has always had some version of that, and you'd have an empirical argument and so on. But, you know, what Foucault would, would say and be absolutely right is that, um, you know, we, we we don't know what the possibilities are in the future, we, we should expect will not look like the past, and consequently, we really don't know. So, you know, I'm, I'm being very you know, careful or trying to, trying to be a little bit careful, at least when, when I say that, you know, Foucault's work points in the direction of the, the recovery of, of spirituality outside of politics. But not to say what that might look like, uh, but only to, to suggest that there's, there's a problem there with the extent to which that function just is being occluded in the current discourse, that it's a kind of necessary function in human subjectivity that needs to occur. And it's, it's the assumption in politics is a problem. But what the solution to that is, like the obvious solution is, you know, religion. But to say that that's the only solution um, is, is unfortunately helping ourselves to, to too much knowledge. Thanks, thanks for the questions, Chris and Mark, for that, that um, answer. I'm not sure I can give anything quite as helpful in response to the question that, that you asked, Chris, but um, I, I think that's a really interesting way to think about whether Dumazil and the contract, and, and um, you could think it in relation to those three functions that he outlines. I suppose what I'll preface it by saying is that Dumazil is a problematic figure. Um, and I, I'm hesitant to see him as the way that we can start to think in a positive way about these kinds of questions. With Dumazil, the political question is not whether he's on the left or the right, it's he's on the right, that's unquestioned, it's how far on the right is Dumazil. And there are moments, and I alluded to one where he talks about Hitler in, in the 1939 text, um, and there's a, a lot of literature that was about kind of what sort of sympathies Dumazil had in the 1930s. And even Didier Erebon, who writes a, a very good book, um, Faute Brule Dumazil, uh, as a kind of a defense, even Erebon's defense is to say, well, he was pro fascist, but he was anti Nazi. So Dumazil as a solution is, is, is certainly not something that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing in this. But Dumazil is an absolutely fascinating figure um, for, for a range of reasons, not just that, that, you know, that he has these, these complicated, very complicated politics, but that he is um, so wide ranging in his interests and that he is so important to Foucault. He's important to Foucault as a, as a kind of mentor figure because he, he supports him very early in his career and then continues to be a friend and kind of uh, sort of mentor Throughout, he was he he's, he he got Foucault the job in Uppsala in the 1950s. He was instrumental in Foucault's election to the College de France in the late 1960s, and and then other moments. And what I'm trying to do in in this talk and in and other work I'm doing is is how do Dumazil's ideas start to filter into Foucault's work? And with it, at least as far as I've gone so far, is is that Dumazil is important in the first function 
of his trifunctional analysis, which is this idea of sovereignty. But he's not important just because he talks about that and the three-way division. It's the divide within the first function that's important for how Foucault is using him, which is what I was trying to stress and, and, and talk about here. But one of the reasons why I think Dumasil is, or, or two of the reasons why I think Dumasil is problematic politically is one is this idea of the hierarchical division of society, whether it's the pantheon of gods or the, the roles within classical Roman society or the castes within Indian society, that hierarchical model of that you are ascribed to a particular function, that I think is politically problematic. But it's also that Dumasil puts so much emphasis on the first and the second functions of sovereignty and the warrior rather than on what you call the Quirinian one, the, the third one of the producer of the, the fabricator, the, the, um, the agriculture, the farmer, and so on. So if there was a positive political way to read Dumasil, then it would be to say, well, okay, so why is it that he doesn't say so much about the third function? And could we reconstruct something in the third function that helps us to understand where, where politics is, is in the present moment? Um, and I think you're right that that that, that model is, is probably rooted in that, the producer-consumer kind of, or, or um, but I think that there's an awful lot of political baggage in Dumasil that you'd have to kind of work through in order to be able to, to take something positive from that. Um, so that, that maybe, that, that's not quite an answer to the question, but it's maybe sort of around some of the issues that there might be in trying to see a a positive thing in Dumasil's work for, for this. Thank you very much, uh, Mark and Stuart, for, for, for those rich and very, very suggestive answers that I shall have to go and think about uh, more. And indeed, uh, as we come uh, to the end of our time, uh, it's, it's with regret uh, that, that I have to close this meeting because such has been your generosity uh, of spirit, uh, openness to uh, to take on questions and ideas, uh, which are, you know, as, as we acknowledged at the beginning, outside the, the sort of core business of Foucault studies, um, that uh, I, I'm incredibly grateful to both of you uh, for being uh, willing to, to come with me on Foucault and the social contracts and for the way in which you've interacted uh, today. It's been an absolute joy. Uh, so please, everyone, would you uh, uh, join me once again uh, in thanking uh, our two wonderful presenters today, Stuart Eldon and Mark Kelly. Uh, and thank you to everyone uh, who has attended as well. Thank you to, uh, to Thaddeus and to Bill who asked uh, such penetrating questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the conversation. It's good to see you both. Yeah. And you. Likewise, Stuart. Thank you. Mm -hmm.